Good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all of you out there, and especially to our moms that are on here with us this morning. And I pray that you have a wonderful day with your, uh, uh, well, such as it is. It's a, we're a little bit of an odd situation with Mother's Day, as we have been with many other of our holidays. But uh, we're going to do the best we can with it. Uh, the sun is trying to peek out for you today. And uh, they tell us that later on we might have a little rain, but we are glad to be here. And I'm glad that you're joining us this morning for our Sunday school class. It's been a really good week so far, I, I would say. With uh, We've had a blessed week with our 10 o'clock program Monday through Saturday. And so today we kind of dig down into the Word of God and, and see what the Lord has to say to us. Today we are approaching a very... Uh, uh, interesting time in our history as we're beginning to talk today about the rapture of the church. We've talked about heaven as it is today, and we've spent some extensive time with that. And so today we will begin with the rapture of the church, and hopefully next week we'll be going into the judgment seat of Christ before we enter into the book of Revelation. I want to just give a little disclaimer uh, here before we get started today uh, and, and uh, about uh, my background and and why I even feel like I have a prayer of even giving you a, a, a class on this. Uh, of course, it starts with some great men I've sat under uh, throughout my life uh, that have influenced me and the way I think about the book of Revelation and the subjects of the rapture of the church and the judgment seat of Christ. And that kind of begins in my earliest days, <clears throat> pardon me, with men like Reverend Bill Stanley, who shaped a lot of my thinking in the very beginning. Uh, uh, also, my pastor for many years, uh, Reverend Wayne Jacobs out at Stony Creek, uh, the Reverend Raymond Riggs, who I sat under uh, at least twice through the book of Revelation and still have many of his notes. And of course, uh, my own father, uh, Reverend Ellis Boffman. And uh, the book of Revelation for my dad was uh, a bit of an obsession, you might say, actually. From the day that he gave his heart to Jesus back in 1967, uh, the book of Revelation just simply became uh, a book that he just could not ever pull away from. And so he spent his entire life from that point on studying the book of Revelation and passed many of that on to, much of that on to me. So I've, I've come to you, I will tell you that uh, some of the, the writings after which I will be pattern, uh, making a pattern of what we'll be talking about come from Clarence Larkin, who even though he wrote his book at the turn of the 20th century back in about 1914, uh, that book and his studies are still the standard for today. And in fact, if you've got your, uh, you should have your outline in your email box. If you don't, you can go to our church webpage and Brother Mike Ringel has been kind to post each one of the outlines on the, on the webpage under the Sunday School link. And uh, the diagram you see drawn in there came from Clarence Larkin. And, and also, I have some patterns that I've really been influenced by is Dr. Tim LaHaye, who wrote, again, wrote extensively throughout his life about end times and the book of Revelation, and is kind of the uh, author of the films you may have seen, the Left Behind series. So that's just a little background on my life, and, and of course, my own meanderings through the book of Revelation have influenced me. And... Today, I, I am influenced a great deal by uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias and Dr. David Jeremiah on these issues. And so we're going to just get right on into it now from that point. And I hope that you'll comment. I hope that you'll learn. One thing I always do, uh, even though I may know what I know, uh, when I enter into a study like this, is I always try to go into it with an open mind and a clear mind. I try to set aside any of my preconceived notions because I want to not only teach, I want to learn. And so if you go into these with too many preconceived notions, 
that you've already determined what's going to happen, then you lose a lot of your ability to learn anything new. So I, I don't, uh, I, I know where I want to go, but at the same time, I want to learn. And so I try to learn right along with you and, uh, and open my mind to things that I may not know or, and as those of you who normally sit in my Sunday school class, you know that I always, uh, I always keep the opportunity to change my mind on a subject when I, when it's, re when the truth is revealed to me. So if you will, and you have your Bibles with you, and uh, I hope you will uh, have a pad and, pe and pen with you uh, so that you can jot down some of the scriptures that I'm going to give you. I'm not going to take you all over the Bible. Uh, I, I believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible, and especially the book of Revelation as we get into it. So I try to take the Bible as literally as I can. And uh, yes, there are some signs, and yes, there are some symbols that we may talk about later, but I try to take it at its word. Uh, but keep in mind, as you go through these things, every day that we live, even what we're going through right now with this pandemic, is revealed in the scriptures, but... You, I mean, think about, and what I'm trying to say is, think about years ago before television. And so somebody looks and reads the book of Revelation, and they see that uh, there'll be two witnesses, and they'll stand in the streets of Jerusalem, and the whole world will see them. Well, they had no idea <laughs> what that was going to be like. They had, they thought of, and the same thing with us. There are things that are being revealed every day of our life that will open up these scriptures to us if we pay attention. And so that's what we're going, and there's a couple of things we might say here that you haven't heard before. So if you have your outlines, you have your Bibles, uh, let's start looking at the rapture of the church. Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Bella. <laughs> oh, what a sweet child. Um, all right, so in the rapture of the church, now, one thing, if you if you Google it, you're going to find out is that the word rapture is not used in the scripture. Um, it developed, in, and quite frankly, one of the places it came from was one of one of Charles Dickens' novels, uh, where we relate the word rapture to uh, the uh, the snatching away or the caught away of the Christians, because that's what the word rapture basically means. It means to be caught up. It means to be snatched up. It means to be carried away. Uh, so, you know, like, for instance, when you fell in love with your wife or your husband, you were enraptured with them. And that's really kind of where the word develops. And so that causes some uh, problems or issues, you may say, for the normal reader when he looks at the Bible and you hear the preacher talk about the rapture of the church, yet you're never going to see that word in the scripture. And so you have to kind of dig a little bit to find out and look for the differences. Because we know from the scripture that there are two um, events that happen that are very similar and yet not similar at all. And they are the appearing of Christ the rapture of the church, and the second coming of Christ. And so we'll try to develop that for you a little bit more as we go on. So narrowing it down in our, in our calendar of historic times, the first great advent or the appearing or the arrival was when Jesus Christ was born as Savior of the world in Bethlehem of Judea. That was the first advent. That's what the, the appearing, the arrival of Jesus, who had been prophesied for thousands of years that Jesus, that a savior would come, a king would come. And, and then there's this period between the end of the Old Testament and the end of the book of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew called the 400 dark years where God did not speak to mankind through his prophets. 
And so if you can imagine, I mean, sometimes today we kind of feel frustrated uh, when we think about that the rapture of the church and that Jesus is going to come and we become impatient and people say, well, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And yet God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And so even when we think about it and we start longing for the return of Christ to take us home, we then think about our loved ones who are not saved, who are not ready to meet Jesus, and then our heart cries out, wait a little longer. And so you can see it's a bit of a conundrum. And in in in, it's kind of like Paul said, I'm in my inside of me, I want to go, I want to go. But it's better for you that I stay. But one day the call will come, and when, he, and when Jesus calls, we'll answer. So I want you to look at that and remember that. That is the first coming of Christ, the, what's known as the first advent, and that was his birth in Bethlehem of Judea. And that, when Jesus comes, he lives on this earth 33 and a half years. And, and I know for some of you experienced Christians, you know what I'm saying. But I have some folks on here who are new believers, so I want to kind of take my time. He lives 33 and a half years, preaches the gospel to every creature he comes in contact with. But his purpose of coming to earth for that first time is to lay down his life on the cross of Calvary and to die for the sins of mankind to redeem us back to God. Then he's buried in a tomb where he stays for three days, and three days and three nights. And then on the third and appointed day, on that glorious Sunday morning, Jesus, the angels come to roll the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but to let the disciples in. Because Jesus doesn't need the stone to be rolled away to get out. But Jesus rises from the dead. He appears to over 500 people, his disciples, the women who came to the tomb, and many others, before he ascends back to his father with his promise that if I go away, I will come again. And so that's what we're waiting for today, is the coming of Jesus Christ to redeem his saints. And so that's what we refer to as the rapture of the church. So you have what we're living in now, and we'll get more into this as we get into Revelation we are living in what is known as the church age. So when Jesus died and resurrected and, and told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he began what is called the church age. We'll get into that. We are living in what is called the church age today, and that is described in the book of Revelation in the early part of the book, and we'll get into that in a few weeks. But the next great event on the calendar of events in Scripture is the rapture of the church. Now, as we look into that, let's look, if you have your Bibles, I want to tell you this, you're going to go to John chapter 14, and actually John chapter 13 at the end of the chapter. I want you to understand this, if you would. And I know, just like when we're talking about heaven, we... We tend, and, and we can't help it. I mean, what can you do? Yeah, there's nothing you can do, except when you get in Sunday school classes, when we talk about heaven, we talk about heaven really as it's going to be someday. Now, we've talked about heaven as it is now, but there is a new heaven and a new earth that's promised to not only the believers in Christ, but the nation of Israel, and that is a little bit up the road, okay? You heard Pastor talk about this. A couple of weeks ago, there's a new heaven and a new earth that is promised to us. And the, this old earth and old heaven will pass away, and the new heaven and new earth will take its place. But generally, when we talk about heaven, we talk about it like the two are joined. But they're not. They're actually two different places. And so that's important to remember uh, when you talk about the, this event and the rapture of the church, okay? So there's there are, when we talk about the rapture and the second coming of Christ, technically speaking, and I mean just very technically speaking, there are no signs 
for the rapture of the church. And you say, no, 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 you're, what are you talking about? Matthew 24, listen, most of the signs that are talked about in the Bible about the end of time are for the second coming of Christ. Most of the signs given is for the second coming of Christ. As a believer, what you need to remember about that is that if I'm correct on that, and those signs that you read are for the second coming of Christ, which is at the end of the tribulation period, that means the rapture of the church is at least seven years before that. And so what I'm saying to you by saying that is, there is nothing today that is hindering Jesus from appearing in the clouds to call his saints home. There is nothing left to be fulfilled. There is nothing that needs to be done to prepare for the appearing of Jesus Christ. So if you're concerned, if you're watching the signs for the second coming, keep in mind that at any moment, the trump of God could sound and Jesus could appear in the clouds and call the dead in Christ with the trump of God and with the voice of the archangel. What are some of the big differences? Well, let me tell you just a couple. One is when the rapture occurs, the world won't know about it. There'll be no warning. It's quickly, it's done quickly. The only people that will hear or see Jesus are the saints of God who rise up from the dead and who are changed, who are alive and remain, and they are changed as we rise in the air to meet our Lord, where the second coming of, the, of Christ, the Bible says that every eye shall behold him. And when the second coming of Christ, he will physically touch the earth and come down to the, to the Mount of Olives to set up his kingdom here on earth. With the appearing of Christ, the rapture of the church, Jesus only appears in the clouds. So there's some huge differences between those two, but we'll develop those more as we go, all right? So there are no signs, really, for the rapture of the church. He could come at any moment. He could come before this Sunday school class is over. He could come before the morning worship today. He could come before pastor finishes his sermon. Before Mother's Day is over, Jesus could come to call his believers, his saints of God, and the dead in Christ. Call them to heaven to be with him forever and ever. So keep that in mind. But on the other hand, I warn you, please, and take this as a warning. When he promised that when you saw Israel become a nation again, which they did in 1948, when you see the European nations gather together, which they are, when you see signs of pestilences, when you see diseases and plagues and earthquakes, he is warning you about the second coming. So if that's warning you about the second coming, you know that the rapture of the church could happen at any moment. All right, so let's kind of move around here a little bit. I want you to... Um, Go with me to John chapter 14. Would you do that? And actually go with me to John chapter, uh, John chapter 13 first. I want to read you some verses there. And uh, of course, my lovely wife and happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers and happy Mother's Day to my wife. She is working as my spotter. So if you have questions or comments, she'll share them with me. That way, if I miss them, that she'll be there to grab them. In John... The book of John, chapter 13, at the end of the chapter, 33, verse 33, Jesus has just, has just dismissed Judas from the Last Supper, and now he turns to his disciples and he says to them, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, as, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Now, Jesus is getting ready to, to die on the cross. And so he is now pressing this to his disciples, the importance of loving one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. 
By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now Simon Peter's going to ask a great question here. And he's going to say, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And then the chapter ends. Now, keep in mind that the Holy Spirit did not put those chapters on there because Jesus, after he finishes talking to Peter, and now you're going to go into John chapter 14, is going to turn to his disciples and say this, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, although in the previous chapter, if you read all of chapter 13, he's already explained this to them. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, there's a couple of great truths here. One is, there is no other way to God. There is no other way to heaven except through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no plan A. There's no plan B. There's no plan C. You will come to God. You will go to heaven through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you will not go. There is no other way. And so he is also telling them that he is going to prepare a place for them, and the rapture of the church is going to be a fulfillment of this promise. So Jesus is saying to you, and he's saying to those disciples, that I am going to prepare, I'm going to go away. You can't come with me right now, but afterwards you will be able to come. And I'm going to go, and when I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I, and if I go, I promise you I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this is an important promise for us in our walk with God It is a source, and we'll get to that a little bit more. It's a source of comfort. It's a source of encouragement, but it also ought to serve as a warning as to how we should live and conduct ourselves now as children of God. You need to live, and I need to live, as if Christ could appear at any moment. So that's really important that we remember that. Now, if you take your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where we're going to go, all right? And uh, there are many other scriptures that I could take you to, but I'm not going to because I like keeping it as simple as I possibly can uh, and and let you, as you learn what we're going to talk about today, hopefully it takes you out in the other directions that you need to go. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul is talking to the Thessalonian church, and he is giving them a bit of an admonition, you might say, all right? He, is, he realizes that from the conversation with the Thessalonian church, that they really don't understand the rapture of the church or what's going to happen at the appearing of Christ. 
So he writes to them, and you might say that this is a little edgy language, but it's really not, especially with the time period. And quite frankly, if it calls your attention out to pay attention, uh, that's what Paul is trying to do. So he says, I would not, in verse 13, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Now listen, when you read a statement like that in the scripture, there's a reason for it. And that means the reason is he's talking to ignorant brethren. They don't know everything they should know. They haven't learned everything they should have learned about the days that are ahead. So he stresses to them, Paul does, I don't want you ignorant about what's going to happen concerning them which are asleep. Now remember when we talked about death and we talked about how death in this life is a monster, but when in eternity it's more of a friend because it takes us right to that doorway. And by the way, let me pause and say our hearts go out today to Brother Jack Ruffner and his wife Glenda. Uh, we learned that sometime through the night that Jack's mother passed away and has gone on to glory. And so she, her soul and her spirit have gone back to God where they belong, and she is in heaven right now. But that fleshly body, Paul says, she's asleep. That body is sleeping, waiting for its change to put on the day when she puts on that incorruptible body. But the soul and the spirit are with God. So he wants, he look again, points to them and says, those believers who died in Christ are not dead. They're asleep. Remember the story I told you about the man with seven, eight children and one of them had died and a, a friend of his asked him, he said, uh, "Do you? how are your eight children? And he said, one is living in heaven and seven are living on earth. He never would give in to the idea that his son was dead. No, his son was alive, but living in heaven. So they're asleep. And so Paul says, I don't want you to sorrow, as, but... He said, even as though others who have no hope. Now, to the person who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, when they die without the Lord, or they have a loved one who dies without the Lord, they have no hope. No hope. Can you imagine living your entire life with no hope? And even going through this pandemic, I just pause here to tell you that you have hope. You have hope in Jesus Christ. This is not the end. This is not going to be the end. And there may be other things we have to face. We never know. We don't know. But whatever we face, we will face with hope in Jesus Christ. But the person who does not know Jesus has no hope. And that's just unbearable. That's miserable. So don't sorrow as others who have no hope. He's not telling you, of course, when our loved ones pass, we feel great sorrow, but we don't feel sorrow as if we will never see them again because we have that great hope in Jesus Christ that we will. So Paul says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. So our loved ones who are asleep in Christ are going to their souls and spirits will come back with Christ and that body will raise out of the grave and be changed in the middle of the air and to put on that incorruptible body. As we who are alive and remain will be changed as we go through the air to meet Christ. Isn't that incredible? And so that could happen at any time. So we sing to you, here's the key phrase, folks. If we believe. So you need to ask yourself, what do you believe? And this is not something you can, you can, uh, well, I think so, or maybe it's true. You have to believe. And if you, if you know Jesus, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, you believe, you've accepted Christ as your Savior. That is your, that is your solemn hope 
that if you do die, if you go to the grave, if your body goes back to the dust, that the soul and spirit will go to God and will one day God will resurrect that sleeping body, change it into an incorruptible body, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. So you need to ask yourself, what do you believe? Now, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So if you've lost that precious mother, if you've lost that precious father, if you've lost that child or, or that brother or that sister, Jesus said, you will meet them in the air and we will all, he said, we won't hinder the dead in Christ. They'll rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Pastor sometimes tries to describe the twinkling of an eye, but that's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> Tommy had a comment. What's that, Tommy? Tommy said, notice how Jesus says in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then notice how he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Already mansions and then a place for you. Just a thought to think about. Isn't that something? And I, you know, and Jesus is really saying like this, you know, it's like, you know, like if somebody, you know, like if somebody tells you something and you look at them like they're, he says, if if it wasn't true, do you think I would lie to you about it? I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. If it weren't true, I wouldn't tell you that. But I'm telling you, Jesus said you have it on the authority of Jesus's own words, those beautiful words written in red, that if I go and I prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again. I'm coming to get you. So, Tommy, that is exactly the right. So, verse 15, he says, and I got to watch my time here because we will get you off here in plenty of time to get a cup of coffee and a donut and join Pastor with his live stream. Okay, so, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You're not going to hold anybody up. <laughs> So, and we talked about that, so let me move. For the Lord himself, now pay attention, the Lord himself, he's not sending an angel, he's not sending the Holy Spirit, he's not sending anybody else, the Lord himself, just as Stephen, when he was dying, looked up to heaven and saw Jesus standing up to receive him into heaven, the Lord himself shall come, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Lord himself is coming to get you. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Is that the whole world that, is, that doesn't believe in Christ will not know what happened. Because the only ones that will, and pastor said this, I think, Friday. Jesus is coming for a people that are looking for him. And the only ones that will hear that voice and that trumpet and that sound will be the believers in Christ who have either remained here on this earth or have died in Christ. They will hear it and the rapture of the church will take place, but the whole world will be left to deal with what's... Can you imagine that? Riding on, air, riding on an airplane and suddenly... You're next to somebody. Listen to me, unbeliever. You're sitting next to somebody. You're working next to them in the factory. You're sitting next to them in an airplane. You're in a car with them. And suddenly they're gone, and the only thing left are their clothes laying right where they were. And the whole world will go into chaos, which will usher in the great tribulation. Verse 17 then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now that's important, again, to kind of separate the appearing of Christ and the second coming of Christ because we are going to meet the Lord in the air. And then he's going to take us to heaven which will usher in the seven-year tribulation period, and it's at the end of the tribulation period that the second coming of Christ, where Jesus will come back, physically touch the earth, 
on the Mount of Olives and set up his kingdom and keep his promise to Abraham and the nation of Israel. So Sandy, that's very important. Yes. Sandy says, think about meeting Abraham, Moses, Moses, Isaac, and Jacob in the air. I know. And think about, think about, and again, you know, you know my, you know how it is. My mind goes, always goes back to the Mount of Transfiguration. And you think about what Peter, James, and John must have thought when they saw Moses and Elijah. You're going to meet them too. Because they're coming with you to get their bodies too. Those new glorified uh, bodies that are going to reign in heaven. So that is a wonderful thought. You're going to see loved ones that long gone. You're going to meet people that you'd only heard of like Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious, glorious, glorious day it's going to be. And so we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And so, And then he says this. He says this in verse 18, and boy, my time is really going fast. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And if you have your notes, you'll see that you could also tell that this is uh, also the word you could use here is encouragement. So when we see, so Jesus left us this promise and this hope so that when someone does die in the Lord, when you do lose that loved one in the Lord, that you can comfort one another with these words. This is not the end. This is not it. They're still alive. We've lost that precious body, that loved one that, that we are used to seeing with our physical eyes, but they are just as alive. There's no break in consciousness. They were here and now they're in glory with Jesus, but they're going to come back with him too. So he says, you can comfort and encourage one another, but you can also press each other to live for Jesus. I mean, there is no greater uh, encouragement or, uh, and there's no, uh, there is no, you know, there's nothing that will make you want to follow Christ more than this. Because the last thing you want to do is miss the rapture. And we're going to talk about that more later on as far as, but you know, and I, and I know it's like deathbed repentance. I believe in deathbed repentance, but that's too risky to chance. You don't know. You don't know. And so if you, if you wait for the, the tribulation period on the hope that maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be able to, to accept Christ as your Savior. You are taking a huge, huge risk. I'd rather bow to him now and give him my life and serve him with all of my heart than I would to wait and not leave a testimony for my children and for all those who love me that I have gone to glory. You don't have to worry about me. I've gone on to glory. So you can comfort one another with these words. And I want to share a couple of other things with you. By the way, if you look at your notes, uh, and uh, I'm kind of, yes, I want you to think about this, okay? The, that cemetery, and you see, and I've kind of put in here the Greek word for what they use for cemetery. And, and actually, the, it's the word we get our word cemetery from, but it's really a hotel or a motel. And so what you've done when you die in the Lord, you just check into a hotel for a short time, get your rest. So when the trumpet of God comes, you can be ready to go meet Jesus. So that's kind of in there. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that because I don't have a lot of time. So I want you to look in the book of Titus now for some, for some instruction from, from Paul again about, about and, and, and some words of encouragement. So Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14 says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying... Now listen, you want to go away in the rapture? You want to be in the rapture of the church? Here's your qualifications. You got to know Jesus Christ. But you also have to... Denying, <coughs> excuse me, ungodliness, worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Well, I believe in Jesus, and I, um, I believe he's going to come back and get me, but that means that I can live any way I want to. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Let me promise you something. The devil believes and trembles. 
You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but Paul talks to us and says, you have to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You have to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope in verse 13, and the glorious appearing, there's that word again, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You do not want to stand before God, either as an unbeliever or a believer, and be ashamed. If you're ashamed of me in this present world, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father, Jesus said. Now, looking unto that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we, he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, oh, listen, I, I want to be a Christian and I want to go to heaven and I want to go in the rapture of the church, but I, I don't want to be different than anybody else. You're in the wrong fishing boat, buddy. Because Paul tells you that when you accept Christ, you're going to be part of a peculiar people. You're not going to be normal by the standards of this world. But you're going to deny yourself and follow Christ. And so that changes, right? That changes you. So no, you can't live just any way you want to and, and go to heaven. The Holy Spirit inside of you is going to clean you up and it's going to convict you. No one has to tell you what sin is or sin isn't. That Holy Spirit will tell you what sin is sin and what's not, what's good for you and what's not. And as your Christ, you go through your Christian life, there'll be times when the Holy Spirit will say, I want to remove this from your life so that you can go up higher with Jesus Christ. And so you're you're willing to do that because you're a peculiar people. Brenda says, um, he didn't say it would be easy. And Debbie replied to that and said, we shall have tribulation in this life, but be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome this world. Amen. And Paul says, I imagine that these small trials that we go through here can't compare to the glory that awaits us. And, and, I, and it's true, folks. It doesn't, you know, and I don't want to, I'm not belittling things that happen to us here. I'm not belittling this pandemic. But I'm telling you, compared to what God has laid up for you, what you're going through right now is small. And any trial that we go through is small compared to the glory that awaits us in heaven. Jesus is going to come and get us and, 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 and take us home. And, and I mean, how will you know? I mean, how? listen, when the trump sounds and the voice of Jesus rings out, you're going to know it. My sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. When Jesus calls, if you're a believer in Christ, you'll recognize his voice. You'll recognize that trumpet sound and you will just go. Whew, I know. So let's, so there's a return, there's a resurrection, and there's a rapture, right? And I'm moving quickly now because we're running out of time. That means there's also going to be a reunion. Now, right now, even as I say that, I can see your smiles and your heart start to warm up because with all the things that we are going to go through, there is going to be a reunion in the air, a meeting. Remember that? Orville loves to sing that song, and it's an old, There is going to be a meeting in the air, in that sweet, sweet by and by. I am going to meet you, meet you over there, in that home beyond the sky. There's going to be a reunion. So we don't have to just think about the return and the resurrection and the rapture. There is a reunion that we are scheduled to attend at the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> Isn't that something? We are all, all of our loved ones today are preparing dinner for us around the throne of God and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So those are some of the things that we talk about when we talk about the rapture of the church. So... 
Uh, we wait, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, we wait for his son from heaven. We're waiting here patiently for the day when Jesus Christ returns to take us home. Be patient, folks. Again, you say, oh, what's, what's taking so long? Well, again, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should have eternal life. When, G, when God finally tells Jesus, that's enough, son, go get my children, and the call comes, it'll be too late. So while, we, while our souls cry to be reunited with our Master and Savior and Lord, it also cries, wait a little longer, please, Jesus. Mm -hmm. A few more days, as the old song says, a few more days to get our loved ones in. But folks, you only have a few more days. Just a short time to speak to your loved ones about Christ and to win them for Jesus. Because any minute that trump will sound, the world will not hear it, only the believers. And we will be changed in the middle of the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But here on earth, that's going to bring about what is known as the 70 weeks of Daniel, prophesied in the book of Daniel, the great tribulation, when God pours his wrath out on the earth. And before I leave you, I just want to stress to you, and I think I might have it here, that Paul tells us, Paul tells us in his, in his writings that God has not appointed us to wrath. And I will, a lot of this is in your notes. I will send some of these scriptures to you that I, I just don't want to confuse you and just run you with too many scriptures. But we're not appointed to wrath. There is nowhere in the New Testament where we're given instructions on how to survive the Great Tribulation. Do you know why? Because we're not going in it. So we are appointed to heaven. When God pours out his wrath upon this earth during that seven-year tribulation period, the children of God are in heaven. And we're going to talk about that more next week when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ before we crack open the book of Revelation. I hope this study has been helpful and beneficial to you today, and I, I pray that God will bless you. We will be here, of course, uh, right here on our Facebook Live page, on my Facebook page, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But now I, I leave you to prepare for pastor's live stream worship service and pray that God will reach someone today for Jesus Christ through the preaching of God's word. God bless you all. I love you. I hope you're ready for the rapture of the church. Pray for your loved ones. Talk to them about Jesus Christ. We don't want to leave anyone behind. We don't want anyone left behind. God bless you.